So in the next few talks, we're going to talk about what hallmarks might exist within a complex system that would indicate the agent-based modeling might be an appropriate approach to understand that system. Now, um, this is obviously related to the last uh, question of why you want to use agent-based modeling. And essentially what we're saying here is that these are the reasons that a representation of an agent-based modeling approach might provide you with a greater value or more bang for your buck than other approaches that you might use to understand that same system. And there are essentially six indicators. The first four, medium numbers, heterogeneity, complex but local interactions, and rich environments, are indicative of when you might want to use age-based modeling. In other words, the more of these that a system possesses that you want to study, the more likely it is that age-based modeling will provide you with a good solution to understanding that system. The last two, time and adaptation, are, um, well, and time is almost a necessary condition. In other words, almost all agent-based models are used to study temporal systems. And adaptation is a sufficient condition. In other words, if a system you want to study contains adaptation, you almost need to use agent-based modeling to understand that system. So let's talk about each of these in turn. So medium numbers. So this idea comes from a paper that John Casty wrote in 1996 called Seeing the Light at El For All, which is a reference to a famous age-based model by Brian and Arthur. Casty was talking about the fact that there are um, a medium number of agents is usually a good clue that an age-based modeling approach will provide you with a powerful representation. If there are too few agents in the system, in other words, just a few agents, right, then the system may in fact be too simple. And in that case, something like game theory or ethnography might actually provide you with a better description than an agent-based model will. On the other hand, if there are many, many agents and they all seem fairly homogenous, then the averages may describe that system well, which means that something like a mean field approach or statistical description might do a better job of describing the system you're trying to understand. The key here really is that the number of agents that are that directly affect the outcome of the system should be a medium number, right? Um, so you could have a, a, a almost infinite number of homogeneous agents, but then if you have a small group of heterogeneous agents that can dramatically affect the outcome of that system, it might be the case that agent-based modeling will work well in this system. And I don't really want to put a particular number on this, right? It's really kind of just this feeling that it's somewhere between too few agents and too many agents, and it really has to do with how those agents interact with the overall system dynamics. So part of the reason why agent-based modeling works well for a medium number of agents is because of the fact that we can describe all the heterogeneity that those agents might have. Agents in an agent-based modeling system can be as heterogeneous as they need to be, and often that heterogeneity is crucial to driving the outcomes of the system. Many other approaches that might be employed, such as a game theoretic approach, uh, often need to assume homog hom homogeneity over individuals, not in all cases, but in many cases, in order to provide a tractable solution to the problem. Agent-based modeling doesn't necessarily need to worry about the um, closed form solution to the problem, and as a result, a large amount of heterogeneity can be incorporated within the system. Complex but local interactions. Agent-based modeling can model very complex interactions between individuals. And the fact that it can model the interactions between individuals to begin with, especially since those interactions have happened over time, is an important thing uh, to use to represent a lot of complex systems. But those interactions can also be history dependent, for instance. So for instance, if you have two agents in a system, they can know the past history of how they interacted, and then that can be used to determine how they might interact in this particular interaction, right? Uh, whereas a lot of other systems would ignore past history and just assume uh, the current state of the world, right? Another example is property dependence. So an agent might react differently uh, to someone who is in a different category uh, of agent class. For instance, in agent-based modeling I'm building recently, uh, we look at the job hiring process. And in that case, an agent might react differently to someone who is a skilled uh, job uh, seeker or a non-skilled job seeker and react differently to how they might decide to hire them. Um, the assumption in almost all agent-based modeling is that all of these interactions are local. 
we're going to make kind of a, a traditional assumption that you only have access to the information you might have access to through these local interactions. And that there is no global agent that tells the agents exactly what to do in all possible cases. And so information does not transmit outside of some sort of local interaction structure. The, the nice thing about that is that it seems to represent a lot of the ways the world actually works in which people only gain information around things around them and are not privy to things that they might not observe.